Hey, uh, if you have your Bible with you, I want to start off right away. Uh, to the title of the message, for those of you who are note takers, is Leading Character. The title of the message is Leading Character. And if you have your Bible, we're going to be in 2 Peter chapter 1. If you don't have one, you can use the one in the row that you're in. That's our gift to you. You can take that with you or follow along online at bcnazarene.org forward slash gatherings. Uh, but as we start this new series, Epic, I'm so excited. Uh, while you're flipping there, give you just a second to get there. I just want to... Uh, pause for a second. So this past month as a church, uh, we celebrated Pastor Appreciation Month. And I just want to say just for a second, uh, on behalf of myself and the staff, how grateful we are, how supported we feel, and uh, how just generous you are as a church. So thank you so much for that. That really does mean a ton. Uh, But I'm going to ask that Pastor Appreciation Month would be extended within this, and that you would show your appreciation by helping me preach the message today. Can you do that? The five of you in the tech booth are in. <laughs> so let me ask one more time. Can, can you help me today? Okay? Can you help me today? All right. Uh, I want to give us a grasp of this passage, and then we'll explain how it ties into this whole idea. Okay? So we're going to come out of the gate a little hot. So I just need you to be ready for that. I know. It's, it's 1115. You've had your coffee, right? You've had your coffee. You've been awake for several hours. Those of you without kids, you just woke up. Those of you with kids, you've been awake for many, many hours now. So we should be able to come out of the gate hot, right? Uh, Quick note, there is nothing worse in the world than being an adult, thinking daylight savings time means an extra hour of sleep last weekend for your kids not to get the memo that daylight savings time means an extra hour of sleep. Monsters. Second Peter chapter one, starting in verse three. This is uh, Peter, one of Jesus' closest disciples, the man who walked on water, the man who is considered the first, like the, the architect of the church. Catholics trace him back as the first pope. Such a significant figure. This is how he starts, okay? There's like just a quick greeting. Hey, this is from Peter, so you know. And then this is how he begins. Verse three, he says, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We're gonna make it through verse three through nine, but we need to pause right there. Don't worry, we won't pause this much throughout the whole service today. Otherwise, we would not get out until 2.30 p.m. But we need to pause right there. This is so important. Not your strength, not your ability, not your wisdom, not your resume, not your accomplishments, not your networking, not your Facebook filters, not your Instagram filters, not, not any of those things. That doesn't give you what you need. He starts right here and he goes, hey, listen, right off the bat, I'm not, he doesn't even ease into it. He doesn't even like give setup. He says, hey, this is what you need to know. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need. Man, that's powerful. This is what I believe. Uh, Tomorrow is Monday. Did you know that? Tomorrow's Monday. And some of you struggle with Mondays. Oh, Monday. So many things I have to do. And it's Monday. Monday. And you run through the day and you just think through like, oh, all these things are going to go wrong. I have to go back to work. I have this. All these things are going to, they're just not going to turn out how I wanted it to turn out. Oh man, it's Monday. And this is what I wonder. I, I believe there is power, not just in our thoughts, but in the truth that we speak. Okay. I, I believe your thoughts have power. Scripture speaks on this. That's why it says, take captive every negative thought. And so I believe your thoughts have power, but I believe there is even more power into truth that is spoken out loud. And so this is what I wonder. What if your Monday don't even worry about the rest of the week. Some of you may want to do that. But what if just your Monday started, you, you woke up and you looked in the mirror, you brushed your teeth because I don't want you to mess with your rhythm and make you forget to brush your teeth, okay? So you brushed your teeth and then you looked in the mirror and you said out loud to yourself, by his divine power, God has given me everything I need. Like how would that shift your focus for that day right from the start? Not got to get this done. If this doesn't go right, and I've already yelled at the kids, and they're going to be late for the bus, and I forgot to pack their lunch, and all these things are off. If you just said, no, 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 that's, that's, not, that's not this day. That's not this day. That's not who I am. By his divine power, God has given me 
everything I need. There's power in that. Some of you should try that. There you go, quick note, try that. There we go. But this is important. He says, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. For living a godly life. A life that God desires, a life that looks like Jesus, a life that is filled with purpose and compassion and love and meaning. He's saying, that's the kind of life I want for you. And God's power, not your accomplishment, not your ability, not your talent, not your network, not your relationship, gives you, his power gives you everything you need to live a godly life. Now, this is important. It doesn't say a comfortable life. It doesn't give you everything you need for a comfortable life or an easy life, or to be famous, or to do everything you ever wanted. You get that from somewhere else. You can go searching other places for that. God has given you everything you need to live a godly life. And I think this is where we often get within the struggle within our faith is we ask God to give us stuff that he has no intention of giving us and then we think he fell through on it. It's like, well, God, why didn't you do that? God, why didn't you do that? Like, that's not my purpose for you. My purpose for you is not for you to have an easy, cushy life. My purpose is for you to have a godly life. And so we go, God, you didn't come through within that moment. Why didn't you come through? He goes, that's not what I'm seeking to do. I'm giving you everything you need in this moment to live a godly life. And then he continues within it. This is so important. Giving us everything we need to live a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him. The one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. He says, all this comes when we come to know him. We've received all this by coming to know him. So I just want to pause right here and let you know, at the end of service today, like at the end of service, almost every single Sunday, sometimes it happens in the middle, but at the end of service today, we're going to give you an invitation if you have never placed Jesus at the center of your life and accepted him as Lord of your life to do so. And the way we do that as a church is we pray a prayer out loud and everyone who's making that decision for the first moment, you pray that prayer with us. And that is so important for me in our service. That is the most significant thing we do in the entire service is pausing for that moment to say, if you have never known that divine power, we wanna give you an opportunity to do so. But it's also important for all those who have already done it, who have already made that decision to remind me, for me to remind myself in praying that prayer that I don't do this on my ability. I don't do this on talent. I don't do this because of the way that I was brought up. I do this based upon his divine power. I live based upon his divine power. Now, I bring that up here in this. So you go, Kevin, why would you emphasize that so much? We usually do it every single week. Why would you emphasize it so much in this moment? And this is kind of why. Because we've gotten to this thing, uh, 1115 service, We've gotten to this thing where it kind of like gets to the end and we get to the salvation invitation and some of you have already prayed that prayer and so you've made that decision and so we get to, hey, we're gonna give you an opportunity to accept Jesus as Lord of your life and some of you start scurrying for the exits. And you go, that's great that you have an opportunity to place Jesus as Lord of your life but I am beating the line to city barbecue and so I am, I am out of here. And so that's, uh, that's for like, I'm just going to assume that's for one of two. Like you would say on the front end, maybe that's because we're not aware of how significant that is. Not just for all those who are accepting that invitation for the first time, but for all those as that recommitment and reconfirmation of our faith. But, but it's not that. Like we all know, right? It's the other people who don't know how serious it is. You guys get it. It's the nine o'clock service. <laughs> they don't know. You know. I know you know. So this is just what I'm going to assume, is that if we get to salvation invitation and you start scurrying for the exits, there's only one explanation possible, and that is explosive diarrhea. (laughs) And so if that's you, I understand. I just want to tell you, from the depth of my pastoral heart, I understand. (laughs) And all those around you in your section, they will understand too. (laughs) 
<laughs> I got that far with a straight face. I, uh, I deserve a medal. <laughs> so he goes through this whole first section. He says, it is, it is his power. It is his power that has given you everything you need. And then he says, verse five, this is important, because you would think within there like, oh, if it is God's power, if it is his divine power that has given us everything we need to live a godly life, then we don't really have to do anything. We can just kind of sit and rest in that. If God is already taking care of it and it's his power, then I'm good, I can just hang out. But Peter says this, he says, in view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. And this is such the important distinction. He's saying, no, 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 you don't, you don't qualify yourself for God's promises based upon your response. He goes, no, 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 it's his divine power. Once you come to know Jesus and accept Jesus as Lord of your life, by his divine power, he's giving you everything you need for living a godly life. But then there is a response. And so understand in our relationship with God, God is not opposed to your effort. He is opposed to your thought that you can earn what is given to you. He's not opposed to you striving for something. He's opposed to you thinking that you can accomplish your own salvation. And so the response matters. Like the response to what God has done is significant. Let me give you an example. So last night, uh, we were up at uh, our alma mater, uh, Mount Vernon Nazarene University, and they had their like 50th homecoming, and so we were up there for a dinner and some other stuff, and we had all our kids, and we come, start to come home, and it's, it's 10 o'clock at night when we're leaving, so it is way too late, and we've got all our kids with us, and we're starting to get them out to the car, and they were cranky, and I was cranky, and that's not usually a good combination, uh, but I tried to turn a little bit, and so my daughter Emily, she's sick, she looks at me, and she goes, I... I'm completely dehydrated. <laughs> and I just want to be like, I will show you dehydrated. But I didn't. I mustered up the little bit of empathy I have in my heart. It's like, oh. And then uh, Molly, who's four, she goes, I am as hungry as I have ever been. It's like, oh, man. And he's completely dehydrated. Like she has literally wilted away. There is no moisture left in her body. And Molly is the hungriest she has ever been in her life. And so I wanted to be like, get over it. Just, we're going home. Go to sleep. You'll be less hungry. Swallow your spit. We'll keep going. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but I didn't. I was like, you know, Bethany, let's go get the kids milkshakes. Let's, let's get everyone milkshakes. And like, that's like, if you're a kid, that should be like, that should be great, right? Like, let's get milkshakes. If I told you right now, like, hey, Larry, let's get milkshakes. Larry's in. Like, Larry, for real, let's get my face. All right, one, two, behind you. Um, and so it was like, all right, we're going to do this. So we're, so we're going through drive through going to McDonald's, go through drive through thinking, oh, there's heaven. All right, this is what we're going to do. We're just going to get milkshakes. So we pull up to the window to order, and the lady who's there, she's like, oh, what do you want? What can I help you? And my kids start immediately like, I want an icy. Can I get an icy? I was like, it's McDonald's. They don't have ICs. Ask if they have an icy. Do you have an icy? No, we don't have ICs. Like, stop it. We're getting, we're getting six milkshakes. And I was really counting that Parker, who's two, wasn't going to drink all his, so I could have half of that as well. That's what I was looking forward to. I was like, we're getting it. And they're like, no, I don't. Well, if I can't have an icy, I don't want anything. You don't want anything? Because you can't have the thing that McDonald's doesn't have? You don't want anything? And I'll, no, I don't want anything. Fine with me. Okay, I'll have a milkshake. I want ice cream. Could we have ice cream? And so we just like go through this whole thing over and over again. And I'm kind of doing that thing that I always used to laugh at other parents for, where you uh, scream rage at your children and then try to have a civil conversation with an adult the next second. It's like, shut up, shut your mouth, never talk again. Hey, I'll pay by credit card. Thank you. So I was doing, I was doing that. And so we go through and we like, we finally order after all this screaming and yelling and we pull forward and I turn around and look at my kids and like, I let them have it. Like the conversation, the lecture that we have all given or received. That's right. It was like, listen, here's the deal. If this happens again, you're never drinking anything again for the rest of your life. But then went through. If I say we're getting milkshakes at 10 o'clock, your only response is, please could I have mine and thank you. If you give me anything else, you're getting nothing. Your only response is gratitude and there should be a response. Now, if I could give you, that's what I said to my kids. This is what Peter is telling us. 
He's saying, listen, here's the deal. You don't have to pay for it. You can't earn it, but it does demand a response. The fact that God's power has given you everything you need to live a life that matters. Let me pause on that to make sure we understand that. It means that if you want something, you don't really need it. Now, you may want it, but you don't really need it. And so the problem comes in when it comes to this idea of his divine power has given us everything we need for living a godly life is we think we need something that we just want. But my six-year-old was completely dehydrated. She wanted a drink. There's a massive difference there. And the reality is this, is that when you begin to want what God wants, you will realize that you already have everything that you need. And that was really good. No one really responded. Thank you. Thank you very much. When you want what God wants, you will realize that you already have everything that you need. There we go. Better response. Thank you. We're moving. And so he says this, verse five, in view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises, supplement your faith. And then he gives a list with a generous provision of moral excellence and moral excellence with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with patient endurance, and patient endurance with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love for everyone. This is what I want us to look at, that list right there, verse five through six. I wanna ask you to imagine someone who is devoid of all those qualities, Someone who is devoid, lacking in all those characteristics. Now, in light of verse three and four, he has already said, no, no, his divine power has given you everything you need. So we're not saying that they don't have a relationship with Jesus. You can have a relationship with Jesus and still be horribly unlikable. Amen? Don't look at the person next to you. We'll keep going. So like that can be there. It's not saying that they're not qualified by God. It's not saying that they're not loved by God. All those things are still present. His divine power is giving you everything you need. But in terms of our response, it says add to these things. And so what do you do about someone who morality is lacking? Or how would you describe someone who has no self-control? Oh, yeah, they're, they're a nice person, but they have zero self-control whatsoever. What do you do about a friend you go, yeah, they're, they're great to hang out with, but there is no patient endurance in their life. As soon as something goes wrong, as soon as something's a little bit off, they're out. They're done. There is no patient endurance there. You see, what, what Peter is describing here is he's saying, his divine power is giving you everything you need, but then the reality is, is that you have a responsibility and your responsibility comes in your response to develop character. That's what he's adding to faith here. He's saying you need to deliberately develop character through your self-control, through your patient endurance, develop character through your brotherly affection, develop character through your love for everyone. I ask you this. Have you ever, have you ever been like engaged in a story, a book or a movie or something like that? Have you ever, have you ever been like part of a story, seeing a story, watching a story, reading a story, and then you all of a sudden realize that you don't like any of the characters? <laughs> Have you ever been in a story where it's just like, all these people are, I don't like any of these people. In, a, in high school, we had to read The Great Gatsby. Anyone have to read The Great Gatsby? But, hang on, let's put them up real high. Anyone have to read The Great Gatsby? Who actually read The Great Gatsby? <laughs> there you go. Look at you, great. We do what we're supposed to do. Maybe we're already done with this message. For those of you who lowered your hand, we'll keep going. <laughs> so I had to read The Great Gatsby. And so I read The Great Gatsby. And I remember at the end, we're just like going through the book. And I just kind of made my way through it. And then we had to take a test at the end. And there were a couple questions. And one of the questions that they asked, they were just checking to see if you read it. They said, what did we learn about the characters? What did we learn about the characters in the story? And I remember thinking through Gatsby and Daisy and all these people who I can't remember now because that book was so important to me and life altering. And it's going through all the different characters. And this is what I wrote. And I remember this because I got full credit and I didn't think I was going to. What did we learn about the characters? And I wrote, they're all terrible people. Because <laughs> they are. They were, they were awful people. 
And, and then a couple of years ago, I uh, tried to get Bethany. I heard all these people talk about Breaking Bad. They're like, oh, you gotta watch Breaking Bad. Breaking Bad is the best. You gotta watch Breaking Bad. I was like, chemistry teacher who makes meth. I'm in. Yeah, that's, it didn't take much. I was like, that sounds really interesting. And so I sat Bethany down. I was like, all right, we're gonna watch Breaking Bad together. And so we turn it on and we watch the first episode. And I was like, oh, wow. Oh, my goodness. He, oh, there we go. That's, that was the visual verbal reaction of me during episode one of Breaking Bad. I'm sure you were curious. And so like, we get done with it and I turn it off and I said, like, oh, so what do you think? Are we gonna keep going? She goes, oh no, I'm done. I was like, you're done? Like this won awards. Everyone we know has said they, they recommend this. And she goes, no, I, I don't like anyone. I don't, I don't like anyone on the whole show. I'm not watching it. I, I'm not watching it if I don't like it. See, this is a, we're in this series, Epic. And in this series, we're looking at the elements of story and how they relate to the way in which we live our lives. And so today we're talking about character. And here's the interesting thing is we look at the stories that we watch, the movies that we watch, the books that we read, the stories that we get engaged in, is for a story to be worth following, it must have a character who is worth following. Like for me to want to hear you tell a story, I need, I need to know it. Like I need to be engaged within it in some way. Has anyone like ever sat you down and told you like a family story or an inside joke of people who you have no idea who they are and you don't care at all? Oh, that's awesome. That's so hilarious that your family all takes naps after Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> Tell me more. I had a, years ago, I went with a friend. We were going to this conference and we, uh, his parents lived nearby and I didn't want to stay at his parents' house, but he really wanted me to stay at his parents' house. I was like, that's fine. Well, I'm a grown man. I have a family. Let's go bunk up with your parents. Here we go. So we, so we go to his parents' house, and we got to his parents' house way, way too early. And so we sit down, and we're there at his parents' house, and they start just sharing all the stories. Like, he was, he was a friend. He was a nice guy. And they start sharing, like, all these stories about him as a kid. And when he, oh, when he was in fourth grade, he did this. And when he was two, he did this. And when he was in high school, he was like this. And then they, like, started pulling out, like, old baby pictures and stuff like that. And I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking... I'm not his girlfriend. <laughs> like this is, this is what Bethany's parents did to me and what my parents did to Bethany. <laughs> I don't need to see your baby photos. I don't care that much. <laughs> but that's interesting. As we look at this idea, like in order for us to want to hear a story, it needs to have a character who is worth following. If there's no one who you can root for, you tune out. If there's no one who you care about, you're done. You go, hey, come, let me tell you the story or watch this movie. You're gonna hate everyone. You'll love it. That's not true. You need to have a character that is worth following. Now, here's where that gets really important. Let me ask you, if you would, pull out your phone. Some of you already have it out. Hopefully you were taking sermon notes or retweeting the message on Twitter, not playing Crossy Road. Okay, pull out your phone. Some of you need to play Crossy Road. There were questions there on Crossy Road. 667 was my high. I was grateful it wasn't 666. That made me nervous. One more. Not the devil's number. There we go. <laughs> Pull out your phone. Now, here's the interesting thing. Unless if you have like mid-90s flip phone or something like that, your phone has two cameras. You see, your mid-90s phone just had one camera. It was right about here. But all of a sudden, I have a, I have a second camera on my phone. And it, it lets me look at me. Now here's the answer. You go, why would I need to look at me? I know what I look like. It's not like I get like later on and just be like, really? How about that? <laughs> Didn't realize that was what was going on. Good for me. Bad for me. No, I, I, we, you have the ability to take what we call a selfie. And what we do is we go throughout our lives and we don't just chronicle how we look, we chronicle where we are with a selfie. I'm gonna invite you right now. If you would, go ahead, take a selfie. This is your, this is your selfie in church time. I'm gonna take a selfie. Everybody say hi. Oh, I made it slip, but I don't have time. <laughs> no, you, you, can, you can take a selfie. 
Because now all of a sudden you have the ability to chronicle your journey through all the different environments, events, and experiences that you're a part of. You used to not have this ability. Okay, some of you need to quit taking selfies. This is making me very nervous. It was like A, take A, A, singular, uno, selfie, A, selfie. There we go, we're good. Some of you like did a quick lipstick check and everything else, fixed the hair. Selfie time in church, here we go. Now, all of a sudden, you have the ability to not just chronicle where you are, but to chronicle yourself at it. And this is why, is because your life is telling a story. Your life is telling a story. And you are the leading character. You are the main character in the story that you are telling. You are the protagonist. You are the most significant figure because you are privy to your thoughts, your desires, your imagination, your fears, your dreams, and everything else that makes you, you. Your life is telling a story and you are the leading character. And this is why that is so important, is if your life is not filled with moral excellence, with knowledge, with self-control, with patient endurance, with brotherly affection, with love for everyone and with godliness, this is what you're going to find, is that you are a leading character, but you don't have a story that is worth telling. Because it is this nature of the cultivation of character that makes it easy to root for someone. This is what encapsulates us in the stories that we watch and the stories that we read is all of a sudden we get engrossed in a character and we want them to win, we want them to move forward. And if that is not a part of who you are, you will find that your story is largely uninteresting. That in order to be a leading character that has a story that is worth telling, you need to have character that leads. In order to be a leading character, you must have character that leads. And you may look at that and you may go, well, yeah, I, already, I, I feel like I already have that. I feel like that's already there and my story isn't that interesting. My story that isn't that compelling. And let me tell you why you think you have that, but you don't. This will be a nice, fun part of the message. Why well, you think you have character, but it isn't actually there. Uh, so this past week, I got the opportunity, uh, I was uh, going to Chicago uh, for some meetings and uh, kind of a small conference and uh, I drove out there uh, because I was like four and a half hours with no people. Woo! I'm excited about that. And so, uh, so I, I drove out there. And as I'm, I'm driving out there, I kept thinking in my head, like, I haven't, I haven't done anything like physical exertion in days. I need to do something. I feel, I feel gross. I feel bad. And so I need to, like, when I get to the hotel, I'm going to run. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go outside, and I'm going to run as soon as I get to the hotel. And so I got to the hotel, and it was cold, because Chicago is cold. And I'm like, heck no, I'm not running, because it's cold. There's no way I'm running outside when it's this cold. And so I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go run on the treadmill. And so I went to see their treadmill, and it was like, I don't know, it was like, it must have been the original treadmill, <laughs> like the first one. Because like, the, the, like the band didn't even really go. I had to like get it moving <laughs> in order to get it started. I was like, I'm not, I'm not running on this treadmill. And so I had spent like, I'd spent like 30 minutes in the car planning out my, my exercise. I was like, no, I'm, I'm not doing that. And so I went to meetings and everything else. And I thought, you know what? There's this other hotel next to it. Some of our friends are staying there. I'll go use their treadmill. That's what I'll do. And so I spent like another 15 minutes thinking through, I'm going to go use that treadmill and come back. And then our meetings got done. And some of the guys are like, hey, we're going to B-dubs. And I'm like, I'm going to B-dubs. There's no way I'm not doing that. So we went to B-dubs and we ate more wings and nachos than anyone ever should. And I got done with that. And I thought, you know, I really, I really should go run. And then I looked at my watch. I was like, it is 11.45 p.m. <laughs> there is no way I am running at 11.45 p.m. So I went to bed. Wake up the next morning. Some guys are sitting there at breakfast and they're like, oh, I rang, I did this yesterday. I worked out yesterday. And I responded, I thought about it. I ran, I ran four miles this morning. I thought about getting up early, but I didn't. And this is what I realized, two things. First off, if I had just run with the amount of time that I had spent thinking about running, I had all the time in the world to do it. 
I just thought, translated that thinking into action, it would have already been done. So it was right there for the taking. But the second thing I realized was this, is that I actually felt better about myself because I had thought about exercising <laughs> than not thinking about it at all. It's like, well, yeah, I didn't do it, but at least I wanted to do it. At least I, I had a desire to run, and that must count for something. Now think about a movie. You watch a movie, and you watch a character. You watch a main figure on the screen. You don't know their thoughts, their dreams, or their desires. You don't know. You don't know, let's say, the biggest villains in movies. You don't know what they really wanted to be. Because we evaluate characters not by what they think, not by what they dream, and not by what they desire. We evaluate characters by what they do. That is what determines a character. That is what determines character, by what you do. And so I don't know that you had thought about helping the single mom with all the kids running around like crazy people. I don't know that you had thought about doing that and wanted to do it. I only know that you didn't. I don't know that you had thought about helping those around you and serving and reaching out. I only know that you, that you didn't. I don't know that in your head, and no one else knows, that you have dreams of significance and making an impact and being helpful and being generous I only know that you didn't. And for some reason we think that like love and compassion and kindness and generosity, that they live in our heads or that they take place in our hearts. They do not, they live in our hands and they live in our feet because character is determined by what you do, not what you think or desire. And so we'd be easy within all this to go, okay, so all we should do is focus on character. That's not what Peter says. In verse five, he says, in view of all this, uh, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need. He says, in view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. And then he says this huge word. He says, supplement your faith. Supplement, not, not make character the main thing. Because my world, we get into a load of trouble when in church we make the focus of everything morality, do we not? Oh my goodness, that is such a problem. So he goes, no, no, this is not the main course. Like, you, you would not just eat vitamins and only vitamins. Take your vitamins. But like, eat food. <laughs> like, have that. Uh, loose translation, man cannot live on protein powder alone. That's what, that's what Peter is saying in 2 Peter verse 5. He says, supplement your faith, add, add to it, make this, make this not the thing that you focus on, make this in addition to. And so I, I wanna show you, because this is so important, this is where we could get into a world of trouble, and so I wanna make this as clear as we can. What he has said in verse three and four is he says, your focus is on what God has done and what his power has enabled you to do and focusing on his promises that he has saved you and he has equipped you to do good works in this world. That is your focus. Your focus is not on the things that you add to faith. He's saying make every effort to add these to it, but don't focus upon it. Now, if that's massively confusing, and I fear that it might be, let me show you what happens when you focus on these things. If we could just walk through the list, just a couple on the list. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence. Now, I ask you, what would happen if you woke up tomorrow morning and instead of looking in the mirror and saying, his divine power has given me everything I need to live a godly life. What, what would happen if tomorrow morning you woke up and you said, today I am going to have a generous provision of moral excellence. First off, that'd be weird, right? Could we all acknowledge that'd be a little weird? But how would you live if that's what you told yourself your focus was gonna be? Today I'm gonna live with a generous provision of moral excellence. This is what would happen. At best you would be a perfectionist. Everybody's favorite, right? At best, you would be a perfectionist, pointing out everything that was wrong. But this is what would most likely happen, is you would take the arenas in your life that you're really good at, 
and you would begin judging people by the standard that you set and you would take the arenas in your life that you're bad at and you would completely ignore them. Sound like anyone you've met? Sound like anyone you've seen in the mirror? You see, that's what happens. If our focus is on a generous provision of moral excellence, we become perfectionists, we become anal, and we become judgmental of everyone around us. No, keep going. What would happen if you said, I'm gonna put all my focus on self-control? This is what today is gonna be. Today is going to be self-control day. Have you ever been on a diet with a donut in the house? (laughs) It's like it haunts you, doesn't it? And it's not like hidden away. You do the thing that you're not supposed to do. You leave it like right out on the counter. You're like, I'm on a diet. There's a donut. How am I going to do it? Self-control, 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 self-control. Sprinkles. (laughs) No, I'm not going to. No, I'm on a diet. No, I don't need to think about that. I don't know. No, self-control. Donut, 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 donut. (laughs) You see, when we put our focus on self-control, we become aware of how little self-control we have even within our thoughts and ideas. And so that's the piece within this. The other piece on it is, man, you're not saved by your body image, you're saved by Jesus Christ. Eat the donut, rejoice in that. Today's the day of resurrection, have two. (laughs) Sing hallelujah, praise God, there we go. I just wanna say, I've said by his divine power roughly 500 times and no one has yet to applaud, but eat the donut, new message strategy, here we go. Keep going, let's look at this next one. Patient endurance. Have you ever tried patient endurance? Today, I'm going to be patient. I told myself the other day with my kids, I was just like, told myself, didn't tell my kids, I was like, man, I have been on a short fuse with these little people recently. I need to, I need to get it together. Like, I need to do something better. I need, to, I need to improve my act. Today, I'm gonna be patient. I had yelled at everyone before 9 a.m. Awesome. And then here's the, here's the last one I'll look at. This is so important. Love for everyone. If your focus is on love for everyone, this is what's gonna happen. And this is the culture that we live in right now, just so we're aware of it. If you put your focus on love for everyone, you may have this like vague hippie notion of, hey, let's all be loving, let's all be peaceful, let's all be kind. And then as soon as someone is unkind or hateful or unloving, you will lash out in anger against them. Because that's helpful. Because that makes things, why are you so mad? Because they're being hateful. So you're being hateful because they're being hateful because you hate hateful and now you've become the thing that you hate. Interesting, great strategy. Similar note of the, hey, we're gonna be tolerant of everything except for intolerance. And so now we're gonna be intolerant of intolerance and the whole thing crumbles on itself because it doesn't work. Because to put your focus on love for everyone doesn't work. But if you shift it and you say, no, 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 that's not my focus. My focus is by his divine power, he's given me everything I need. And so my focus isn't on me. My focus isn't on them. My focus isn't even on my character. My focus is on what God has done and what he has promised. And then walk right back into that world. And you go, love for everyone? Well, God loved me. And I'm not perfect, and I know they're not perfect, but I can certainly have love for everyone within this because I remind myself that they don't need to rise to my standard because God loved them just as he loved me. How do I have patient endurance? Well, it's because I'm not lacking. I don't have to make this happen because he's given me everything I need for living a godly life. And so if it's not there yet, I don't even have to wait on it because I know that God has given me everything I need. So patient endurance is that much easier. Self-control, same way. Moral excellence. You go, no, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not held to the standard. I am free to live, to create good in the world and help redeem the kingdom that God has set out to establish. And all of a sudden, when we shift the focus from developing character to focusing on God, all of a sudden, character becomes a byproduct. And then this is how he finishes verse eight and nine. I told you we were eventually gonna get to verse eight and nine. He says, the more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's given us two options. He's saying, the more you put this as your focus, you will become not just faithful, but fruitful in your life. You will not just be saved, but you will create significance in the world that you live in. And then he gives the second option. He says, but those who fail to develop in this way, those who fail to develop character in this way are short-sighted or blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sins. 
So this is what I wanna ask you, BCN. And we're gonna ask you every week of this series. What story do you want to tell? With your life, what story do you want to tell? What do you want your kids to say about you? What do you want your grandkids to say about? What do you want your friends? What do you want your neighbors? What do you want your coworkers to say about you? What story do you want to tell? And I'm contrasted by this idea that we spent so much of our life, so much of our effort developing talent, developing ability. And yet I have never once been to a funeral in which someone got up there and read off someone's resume. I've never once gotten, went to a funeral and had someone's kid get up there and say, well, listen, here's the deal. My dad had a 3.7 GPA and he was manager of the month two times. We should all celebrate him. No, that's not the words that we speak. What do we say? Well, how do we remember when we praise, when we celebrate someone who we know at those significant moments? We say they were kind. They were generous. We say they were loyal. They were present. You see, the thing that we celebrate more than anything else is the character that someone has. And you want your life to be interesting? You want your life to matter? You are already the leading character in the story that you're telling. My question for you is, do you have character that leads? And so this is my urge to you, and this is why I'm gonna ask you this every single week. Tell a story with your life that is worth telling. Live your life in such a way that when people go back and tell your story, that they're proud to know you, that they're proud in how you invested your life because you had leading character in the story that's about your life. Let me pray for you, BCM. Father, my prayer for all of us today is as we walk out these doors, as we wake up tomorrow morning, as we do everything that we need to do that you have called us to do, that we would know that it is by your divine power your divine power that you have saved us and that you have equipped us. And so let us live our lives in response to that amazing, incredible truth. Give us lives that matter. Give us stories that are worth telling, that we would have a character that is solid, that is strong, and that makes a difference in the world that we live in. And we pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.